Hey, how's it going guys? We're going to continue translating figures in this video, um, second one for section 9.1, but what we're going to focus on here is what are called vectors. I mentioned those in the first video. Now you're going to learn what they are and be able to do a few things with them, as you see in the goals that are stated here. One of the goals is that you will find the component form and the magnitude of a vector. And then another goal is that you'll use vectors to describe and transform or, and actually perform translations. Well, let's get into what a vector is first. And I want to use a picture that I used in the previous video. What I showed you in the previous video is that whenever you're translating a figure and you move every vertex the exact same distance and direction, that those little ray-looking things that I drew right there are called vectors. Okay. Now I'm going to write down the definition for a vector and then describe it a little bit further for you. By definition, a vector is a quantity that has both direction and magnitude or size. Now part of that definition seems a little bit weird because it calls a vector a quantity when it looks like a vector is a geometric figure and, and both are really true. Um, really the reason that we'll mention that a vector is a quantity is because vectors are used for so many real world applications as you'll see in a physics class for instance. Um, it can represent a force, it can represent acceleration, it can represent a lot of different things. Okay, but the point here is this, that a, magnet, a vector has a definite direction, all right, you can see every one of these vectors is going exactly the same way, and it has a magnitude or a size, meaning it has a definite length. Now, if you're describing a, what a vector looks like, you're going to say it looks like a ray, but there's definitely a difference between a ray and a vector, and I'd like to compare the two right now. Let's look at rays versus vectors, um, and in addition to comparing rays with vectors. I'm also trying to teach you a little bit about notation here, so make sure you're paying careful attention. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a ray PQ, and I'm also going to draw a vector PQ for you. And in order to do either one of those things, we need a point P and a point Q. Now, in order to draw the ray PQ, what you need is a ray that begins at point P, and it goes through point Q. Alright, so it starts here and continues through point Q like that. And so I can say that that ray PQ begins at point P and it goes through point Q. And it's the fact that the ray would pass through point Q that would differentiate ray PQ from vector PQ as you'll see in a moment. Now another thing that uh, is true about a ray because it just passes through a point is that it has an undetermined length. Or in other words, you can say that rays are infinitely long. All right, now let's con compare that and contrast it with how you would draw a vector PQ. I'm going to have a point P and a point Q again. Now when I'm drawing vector PQ, just as with ray PQ, we're going to say that that vector is going to begin at point P. Ah, didn't realize the time I was going. But anyway, it's going to end at Q, and that's not a very straight vector right there. Let's just say that this is the vector PQ then right there. All right, so an, because it actually ends at point Q, a vector is not infinitely long. It is finite, right? And so it has a definite distance or magnitude. And so the fact that vectors go a specific direction and have a specific length makes them great for translations. Now, I mentioned notation a little bit ago. You're familiar with the notation for a ray where you put the initial point and then the terminal point of the ray, well, the point that it passes through in that order, and then you put the little ray symbol right above it, okay? Well, with vector PQ, the notation is very similar. It's just that instead of an entire ray, you kind of have the top half of a ray only. You only get the top half of the arrow right there. Now, you still have to put the initial point first and the terminal point second, but the symbol is just half of the ray's symbol. 
Excellent. So let's take a look at some of the problems that you will need to work with involving vectors. Um, one of the things that you're going to need to be able to do is be able to write the component form and find the magnitude of a vector. I guess that's a couple of the things. And so what we're going to do in this example, a couple of examples like it actually, we're going to name the vector that you see in the picture. You're going to write its component form and then find its magnitude. All right, well, naming the vector I just talked about in the previous slide, if I wanted to name this vector right here, I've got to name it first using its initial point and then using its terminal point. So we would call this vector TS. And you can write out the word vector TS or you can write that symbolically like this. Write the initial point first, then the terminal point, and you put that little half ray symbol or vector symbol right above it. Okay, now right after that, I'm going to write the component form for the vector. Notation here is super important. You see you put in these little brackets, which are very important. I'll describe that a little bit more later. But when you're trying to write the component form for a vector, what you're trying to do is describe the direction of the vector. Remember, a vector is a quantity that has direction and magnitude. So the component form tells you the direction. And essentially, it just tells you how far left or right from the initial point you go and how far up or down from the initial point you go in order to get to the terminal point. Now, if we look at our vector TS and we're trying to find out what its horizontal component is, well, we have to start at T and we have to go to the left. I'm actually going to draw that. This would be the horizontal part of that vector TS. And how many units is that? Well, it's one, two, three, four, five, six units. Now, I'm going to start generalizing here so I can explain specifically what I'm writing within these brackets here. Whenever you're writing the component form of some general vector AB, what you do is you write in this form where you put those two little brackets that I showed you, and then you list two coordinates. It looks like you're listing an X and Y coordinate, which is similar to what we're doing, but not exactly what we're doing. Um, the first number that I called A right there is supposed to represent the horizontal component of the vector. And looking at our vector TS, the horizontal component is six, right? You go six units to the left. Now the other thing is that you have to use signs to determine which direction that is going. So if it's going to the right, you consider the component to be positive. If it was going left, you consider it to be negative. This is going left, so we'll say the horizontal component for that vector is negative six. Then of course the B is going to describe the vertical component which tells you the vertical change from the initial point to the terminal point. And vertically, to get from T to S, we would have to go up two units. That would be this distance right here. And whenever you're discussing the vertical component, positive means up, negative or means down. And so since we went up, we would say this vector had a, a positive 2 for its Y or its vertical component. All right, so there's the component form for the vector. Now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to find its magnitude. And what the magnitude is is simply the length of the vector. It tells you how far it is from the initial point to the terminal point. And as the magnitude is just a distance and we're working with a coordinate plane, you're just going to use a variation base. It's, it's the distance formula, but it's going to look like a variation of the distance formula in order to calculate that magnitude. Or heck, you can even describe it using Pythagorean theorem if you like. You notice when you draw the horizontal and the vertical component that they form a right triangle where the vector is the hypotenuse. And so if I were to try to find the length of the hypotenuse using that right triangle, I could say 2 squared plus 6 squared equals the hypotenuse squared. And so the hypotenuse would be the square root of 2 squared plus 6 squared. Now please allow me to generalize here. Whatever you want to find the magnitude of a vector, simply all you have to do is take the square root of the sum of its horizontal component squared and its vertical component squared. Or more simply put, if we say the horizontal component is A and the vertical component is B, the magnitude of vector AB can be found by taking the square root of A squared plus B squared, which is what I just did right there, the square root of 2 squared plus 6 squared. Now, I know the horizontal component was actually negative 6 there, but don't positive 6 and negative 6 give you the same thing when you square them. So trust me, it does work. And for this one, then, let's go ahead and simplify it. That would give you the square root of 4 plus 36, the square root of 40, or 2 squared of 10 would be the magnitude for this vector TS. 
Now, when you're trying to write the magnitude of a vector, you could just use the word magnitude and say that it equals whatever it equals, or you can write the name of the vector and put it in absolute value symbols. You might recall that absolute values are distances, right? And so is a magnitude. So they share the same symbol, it turns out. So you can say that this means that the magnitude of vector TS is equal to 2 square root of 10. Now let's do another example. You know, again, we're going to name this vector, we're going to write its component form, and we're going to find its magnitude. All right, so the name of the vector is easy. You can look at the direction the vector is going and notice that Q is the initial point of this vector. P is the terminal point, so this has got to be vector Q, P, which we'll write this way. And then we'll say what its component form is. Always horizontal component first, then vertical component. This is not slope. It's not rise over run. All right, so let's uh, say the horizontal component would be this way. You go left three units. And so our horizontal component is going to be negative three. Then the vertical component, we're going to have to go down. And how far down are we going? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units. And since the vertical component, vertical component was going down, it's going to be negative. We're going to say negative eight is the vertical component. Now for the magnitude of vector QP. Remember the notation that you can use? You can essentially just put it in absolute value signs, but it means the magnitude of the vector. And in order to find the magnitude, all we've got to do is take the square root of the horizontal component squared plus the vertical component squared. All right, so here, the square root of negative 3 squared plus negative 8 squared, that's going to give you 9 plus 64, so the square root of 73. Can't simplify that any further. That's the magnitude of that vector. Pretty easy, right? Okay, now, we're learning vectors because they go along with translations, and so I want to show you one example where we're actually using vectors to translate a figure. And this is the figure that we're going to translate then. The directions say translate the quadrilateral using the vector negative 1, negative 5. Now, very important. I didn't really discuss this earlier as I meant to. Whenever you write the component form of a vector, make sure you use these brackets that you see right here. Do not use parentheses. If I put negative 1, negative 5 in parentheses like this, that's an ordered pair. That's just a point that I could graph. You have to put it in component form whenever you're referring to a vector. And the same thing, or kind of converse that, I suppose, if you're ever referring to an ordered pair or just a point somewhere, you wouldn't write, say, this point X as being 3, 3 like that. You would write it as 3, 3. So the way that, you, inside parentheses, the way that you've always learned. So be careful with the notation for everything there. All right, now, we, remember, whenever you translate a figure, you just move each of the vertices of that figure the exact same distance and direction. And when we're translating this quadrilateral using the vector negative 1, negative 5, what that means is that we're trying to translate it so that every vertex gets moved one unit to the left and then five units down. So let's do that. So from point W, if I go left one unit and down five units, I end up right here. I'll label that as W prime. And let me show you the vector that we're using. All right, there is that vector. It starts at W. Ooh, that's not what I meant to do. Starts at W and then ends at W prime like that. If I wanted to name the vector, then there's the name of it right there. And really all we have to do is use that exact same vector for all of the vertices. So I can physically kind of copy and paste right here. You obviously can't do that on paper. Um, what you can do is just move every point one unit left and then five units down. But watch what's going on here. Let me go ahead and copy-paste. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. And I could begin that vector at point x. And at the end of it then would be x prime. And then I could copy it over to point y as well. And there's y prime. And do the same thing for z. And voila, we've got the four vertices for the image of our quadrilateral. 
w prime x prime y prime z prime right there and you can see it's congruent to the original as any isometry ought to be and every vertex was moved to one unit left five units down so there's how you'll use vectors for translations and how you find a component form and the magnitude of a vector thanks for your attention guys hope this works well for you see ya